see you all in conversation as though you were actually around the table joining Alexa here. All right. So we've just opened the webinar. Just wait for a few seconds for folks to connect. Welcome in, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll get started. Good afternoon or good evening and welcome to Decision Making and the Brain, a roundtable discussion moderated by Concordia public scholar and doctoral candidate in experimental psychology, Alexa Ruel. Alexa's research is as to how and why decision making strategies change over her lifespan has led her to invite some of the leading researchers and their I say brains in the field to engage in this discussion. And so we're very much looking forward to what's about to tran transpire. Thank you all for being here. It's great to meet you in this way. We are streaming to you YouTube live from Concordia University's For Space, where Alexa joins me today, located on the unceded indigenous land in Jojage, Montreal. At Four Space, we facilitate daily activities that investigate what Concordia community members and their collaborators are working on, especially in terms of process-based research and university-wide initiatives. So we're very pleased to host this roundtable conversation. I'll just mention that since we are running this as a webinar and Alexa has a lot of duties, she's participating in the conversation, she's moderating the conversation, she's uh, organized the conversation. If you do have a question um, and you're joining us via Zoom, we would ask that you use the Q&A box proper just to uh, allow Alexa to focus on one place to keep her eye on for interested comments or questions coming in. And if you're in the space, you got, you already got some uh, kind of rules of engagement and behavior here. So welcome in for those of you who are joining us live. All right, folks, without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Alexa. Welcome. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we're going to be having over the next two hours. Um, and just before we begin, just again for our audience members, I really want this to be an interactive process as opposed to something you just listen to passively for the next two hours. Um, so like Anna said in the beginning, feel free to put any questions you have as we talk over um, the next little while in the Q&A box at the bottom of the um, webinar page. And I'll make sure to check that frequently and ask questions kind of um, as I see fit as we go through our discussion here. Um, so maybe we should start with some introductions. I'll start with introducing myself, and then we can go around the, the virtual table, so to speak, and have a little short introduction for each person. Um, so yes, as Anna introduced myself, my name is Alexa. I'm a public scholar here at Concordia, as well as a PhD student in experimental psychology. Um, I'm in my fourth year, so I've been studying uh, decision making for a little while now, uh, focusing on how it changes across the lifespan from childhood to old age. Um, and I thought it'd be really great to have a discussion with um, other researchers in decision making and their um, unique perspectives on the topic and try to get a conversation going among all of us and also see uh, what you guys think at home about anything that's being discussed, any questions you have about what decision making is, how the brain is involved, how all of this works at the neural level, um, how we make decisions in our day to day life and how social interactions play a role. Um, so yeah, that's that's my little introduction. Um, whoever would like to introduce themselves, feel free to unmute yourself and go next just to give everyone an idea of who you are and why you're here. I can go first. <laughs> um, I'm Orgel Falman Hall. Um, I am a professor at Brown University and I study social cognition. And I guess you'll ask questions that are relevant to the topics that I study, I hope. Uh, I'm Nathaniel Daw. I'm a professor at uh, Princeton University in uh, neuroscience and psychology. Um, my background's in computer science and I'm interested in using ideas from artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, as ways of thinking about hypotheses for how the brain approaches problems of decision-making and planning and learning. Um, and that's that's what I do. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Anne Collins. I'm faculty at UC Berkeley uh, in psychology and neuroscience. I'm very interested in how humans 
uh, learn um, in a way that is so flexible and efficient um, compared in particular to artificial agents. Um, I'm French. <laughs> So thank you so much. Um, we're one more panel member is supposed to join us in the next hopefully few minutes. Um, so whenever um, she joins us, we'll just cut and make sure she has a chance to introduce herself before we keep going. Um, yeah, so let's jump right into it. I think uh, introductions are a good, a good place to start. But I think the next next place or next question that comes to mind for me is just to have one of us maybe talk about like, well, what is it when we say we study decision making or what is what is decision making and kind of how do we how do we approach that? How do we study that in either a psychological um, but in the psychology background or from a neuroscience perspective? So um, whoever wants to jump on that question, feel free, and then I'll, I'll have some more targeted questions as we go along. I mean, I can jump in if, uh, um... I mean, of course, decision making is behavior, right? Many all day long, all we do is behave. We move and we go from place to place and we interact socially with other people. Um, and all of these things involve deciding what to do at different levels. Um, how we often, many of us often study decision making in the laboratory uh, is more about making discrete choices for uh, often for money or for reward and punishment. And so one big aspect of decision-making is, as it's studied in, in psychology and neuroscience, is financial decision-making, decisions about risk, decisions about uncertainty or under uncertainty about financial outcomes. Uh, that's a sort of industry. Um, and how we learn and how we plan, it's, lot, it's lots of different things. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a great answer. I think it's it's always a, a tricky question to answer because I know at least for me, decision making is yes, it's a behavior, but it encapsulates so much more than that that it kind of gets into, um, you know, there's difficulty in explaining really what is part of decision making, what is not, and then depending on the context, there's just so many other factors to consider. Um, so I think that's a great that's a great start. Um, one thing I was if I if I could in... add something, oh, um, yes, absolutely. I I think a lot of decision making is actually. Um, uh, um, not directly observable as behavior. And I think that's important to keep in mind because we make lots of de decisions that are not translated um, into something that we can directly observe. And I think that's one of the main challenges actually of uh, studying decision-making because we know those decisions happen, but we can't observe them directly. Uh, so there's lots of work to be done to, um, to infer those decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to give our audience maybe an example of what a decision that wouldn't be observable would look like or in what context would that happen where there'd be a decision, maybe part of it is observable, but not all of it in its entirety? I, I, yeah, I, I, I was thinking, actually, that's why I was muted. Um, I mean, the observable decisions are, are, are easy to give examples of, right? Like you'll, you'll choose to, you know, turn right or turn left or something like that. Um, the unobservable decisions might be, you know, um, what goal you decide on, for example, like you might be deciding, you know, uh, uh, you might be deciding to, uh, you know, go one place versus another, uh, that's going to translate into lots of small decisions that don't immediately um, reflect what your long-term decision um, is. Um, and or you might be deciding to pay attention to something versus not pay attention to something, which is going to be even less uh, observable. Absolutely. Um, I see that uh, Dr. Yael Niv has just joined us. Um, so maybe we'll take a little, a little quick break here to give her a chance to introduce herself so people are not wondering who this additional person is. Um, if you want to just give a short introduction about who you are and what you study for our audience, it'd be great. Sure. Um, you can hear me okay? Yeah, sounds loud and clear. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I was late. I had a medical appointment that couldn't be moved. Um, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Yael Niv. Um, I am a um, uh, professor of psych psychology and neuroscience at Princeton University, and I study um, learning and decision making. Um, coming from kind of a background and tradition of, of uh, studying reinforcement learning in particular, but really extending that to thinking about how we make sense of the world, how we, um, how we represent the tasks that we need to learn how to solve and how that 
process um, interacts with memory, with attention, with, uh, and with mental illness as well. Awesome, thank you. So happy you could join us today. Um, so yeah, we're just talking about what decision making is and kind of how it's, it's both a behavior, which is, can sometimes be manifested, observable. Um, it also involves a whole bunch of cognitive processes and it also sometimes is a um, decision is something not, not observable. So deciding towards a goal or to avoid a certain goal. Um, so all these different kind of things that are part of what we, we all study or what we talk about when we mean decision making. Um, so one of the questions uh, that I've been asked recently and thinking about and kind of wrote a little bit on this is um, how decision making and choice are sometimes used interchangeably, but are different in a fundamental way. Um, and the way I kind of conceptualize it in so far is that a dis the decision making is kind of the process that would happen before the actual choice is made. And this is mostly based on how we've examined it in the lab and how I'm kind of examining decision making and how it changes across the lifespan. Um, but I was curious to see if in your different fields or how you guys have been studying decision making, if choice and decision making are really kind of closer together, or are they really more distinct in your mind? Um, and we can start with uh, maybe Oriel, if you want to speak to that, or Anne, whoever would like to go first. Sure, so I also use them interchangeably. <laughs> um, I guess you could say that choice is, for in the way that I study, is the instrumental action one takes. So I study social cognition, social decision-making and learning. Um, things like being altruistic or cooperative those are observable actions. I guess you could have a motive or a goal in general to be altruistic or collaborative or cooperative that may not translate on a day-to-day -day basis with a particular individual um, in that way. But um, I would actually say that, you know, Anne brought up an interesting thing that I think actually has philosophical um, tethering because for me, um, the goals, at least the way that I think about things um, in the sense of what Anne just brought up is more of the, it's like a level of algorithm that we're trying to understand of how choices are implemented. And a goal can be a part of that process. So maybe to your point, um, the, the decision-making is the larger penumbra term of which choice and action falls under. And under the decision-making hood can come a lot of things and different levels that you can look at for how people, let's say, make choices or think about goals and act on those goals. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see the, the, the similarity or the distinction between the terms and how it kind of will differ slightly based on how you study, how you approach these different processes in your specific field and the questions you're tackling. Um, Nathaniel, did you want to, um, to add? Yeah, I was just going to sort of amplify that because I was struck uh, by what Anne said before about how decisions can be covert or not observable. And I was sort of having a hard time thinking about that. But what you, I think the distinction that you made between the, the choice as the thing that you actually do and the decision making process as what happens in your head to sort of figure out what to do, if, if that's how you're thinking about it, that's certainly one way to think about it. Um, <clears throat> I, th I think that sheds light on, on part of what I think uh, Anne meant before. Uh, and certainly one thing that we're really interested in is it's easy to see what you do. You press buttons on the computers in our games and so on, but figuring out like why you do that, what processes you go through in your head privately uh, that aren't accessible to us to, to, to uh, make those decisions. What, how did you value the consequences? What other possibilities did you consider um, that's sort of a huge aspect of what we do and trying to figure out how to measure the part of why we're interested in using neural measurements is to try to get to read out from your brain a little bit of uh, the things that we can't observe from your behavior that's antecedent to it. It's helping you figure out what to do, the decision making process, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yael, did you want to add to that as well? I see you raised your, your virtual hand. Yes, I did. I, I didn't know if you'd decided to not raise hands. Um, I, so I missed, I missed whatever Anne said before that was so influential, so I might be repeating. <laughs> um, but I wanted to put in uh, kind of a plug for um, reaction times and do we consider those choice or not? So those, are, you know, there's a decision that's made on more than what do I do, but also how do I do it? How fast and, you know, with what muscles and things of that sort. Um, and we don't often think about with what muscles, but we do think about how fast. 
Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say that might be related to what Anne said before that I don't know what it is, is that I've been thinking more and more that um, kind of choice or decision making at every level kind of internal and external are the same. So if I'm choosing what thought to have, um, that that's also, you know, it might use the same exact um, or, or what even to bring to mind, uh, it, it might it might use the same exact process, neural processes, even though it's completely internal. So I don't know. I mean, you could still call it choice. You could still call it decision making. Uh, the, the names don't really matter to me, but um, but I, I, I'm also like moving away from thinking that only the observable is is studyable and is relevant and important, especially in the context of mental illness. There's a lot of internal choosing of what interpretation to give to things uh, that, that we can control and we can learn to control so, um, uh, and to change, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's super interesting to think about internal, external, and um, something Nathaniel brought up, I wanted to kind of loop back to it, just so our audience is on, on, the, on the same page with us too, is um, oftentimes it, it's tricky to understand, well, how do you study decision-making? Like, what does it look like when you're saying, I'm, I'm examining this, this decision-making um, system or mechanism or something, like, what is that? Um, so I can talk a little bit about this. I'd like to see how maybe it differs or it's the same for each of you um, based on kind of the different research questions you're interested in. Um, so just for our audience, when we say we're examining the decision-making process, um, it kind of looks like participants would come into the lab and more or less do a very repetitive video game um, in which we've controlled it in a certain way to be able to examine, well, when this happens or certain things changes, what do you do? Um, and in these contexts, of course, you're playing this novel video game. So there's often a learning um, aspect to it as well. So you can think of decision-making in some contexts as a learning process in addition to the decision-making that happens there. So you have to kind of learn, well, how does this game work? And once you've learned how the game or the kind of boring video game works, then you would repeatedly make different decisions in order to get as many points, um, like was alluded to before, um, to get as much money as you can by the end of it, or maybe you're trying to avoid some type of um, negative outcome. Um, and in this process, we're able to look at things like reaction times, like, well, what was actually done? What button did the participant click at this instance? Um, but to get out kind of the behind the scenes, the things that we don't necessarily see as a overt decision, um, we look at neural mechanisms. So we'll look at what is the brain doing when you're making these decisions to really get a full picture of, well, what is happening at the neural level that led you to make this decision? How quickly did you make that decision, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I don't know if anyone wanted to add to that, but just to kind of give um, our audience a little bit of a um, insight in terms of what, what does it look like to study decision making in the lab. Um, Anne, go ahead. Yeah, I just like to add that um, uh, you don't necessarily need to jump into looking at the brain um, to get a handle on those uh, hidden processes. So I think a, a lot of the work that uh, all four of us do really um, is about um, uh, designing those games so that you can get as much information as possible just from the behavior um, um, as to what various processes have contributed to a given observable decision. And that's where I think, um, you know, computational modeling um, uh, becomes particularly um, helpful because it helps us formalize those uh, processes before looking at the brain. <laughs> yeah, I'll just jump in and say, I think people, you know, maybe people are slowing down a little bit, but there was a time in the field of psychology, psychology and neuroscience, where if you ran a behavioral study, you would throw it in the scanner. Like, let's find out what the neural mechanisms of X are. And I think that, you know, maybe this is from being trained by trigger shy neuroscientists, but I don't think that that's necessarily the answer for just uncovering the mechanism. There are cases where if you want to look at, let's say, representation or like how representation representation is changing, you do need to look in the brain, but you can also do, create really clever experiments that can help tease these things apart. You can also use computational modeling. There are different tools that we have in the toolkit that can help us figure out why people are doing things without immediately running to the scanner and spending $50,000, in my opinion. I want to say even more that I think those tools are sometimes they tell us a lot more about the mechanism than looking in the brain because a lot happens in the brain in the brain all the time. Um, stuff that's related to the task, stuff that's not related to the task, stuff that's 
ancillary, but is not part of the decision right now, but maybe is happening uh, reliably concurrent with the decision. Uh, and it might look to us like that's part of the decision, but it's not. Um, and, and also just, there's so much complexity there that we don't understand that um, it doesn't always help basically to look into the brain. I might try to take the other, I mean, actually, of course, agree with all you guys on this and spend most of my time thinking about behavior and trying to squeeze as much as I can out of it. But it's also the case that like, there are questions that I'm interested in that are just really hard to tell from behavior. And I've struggled with it for, as I think we all have for years, um, where the answers I hope are in the brain. So the, the one that, that I'm really interested in is, is if you're, you know, you're playing a chess game uh, and you know you make some move, but the reason you did that presumably is that you thought through different paths of what moves and counter moves and, and what's gonna happen several steps down the line. I know you didn't think through all of them, right? There wasn't time, it's not possible for you to think through all possible you know, paths through chess. So you had to think through a few and your brain had to be pretty smart about which ones to think through. Um, and, and whether you make a good choice or not turns sort of crucially on whether you, anticipate the right sort of future lines in, in chess or life, really, social interactions. Um, and I'm fascinated by that question, but I've never been able to get much of a, as many of you know, because we've all tried, a handle on that from choice behavior, because it just, which pawn you move doesn't reveal a lot about all the things you thought about to get there. Uh, and so I've started getting particularly interested in uh, rats running in mazes, uh, where you can actually apparently see in their brain in, in uh, neurons that represent their location, um, them thinking about routes while they're standing still, uh, their brain uh, represents paths through the world and then sometimes they take them, sometimes they don't. Um, and so I'm hoping, and this is still remains to be seen, that this is actually something I can look at in the brain and understand that will reveal something that I'm really interested in that I haven't been able to, despite trying, sort of squeeze out of behavior. I wanted to say, oh, oh sorry. Ahead, that I think when you have, in domains where we know a lot about, right? We know a lot about things like how location is represented in a specific area of the brain, the hippocampus. Uh, we know a lot about how uh, errors in making predictions about reward are represented. Um, in those domains, when you come with a, with a very clear hypothesis, you can get a lot from the brain. So I did, didn't mean what I said to be like taken completely generally, but where when you're when you have less clues, it's like you know looking into the brain is looking into another big clueless mass, um, and that's where I think computational models are very useful for us, and that's where um, uh, because they, they they can ask specific questions about process, that then once we know what the process maybe is, or at least uh, computationally, we have an idea what to look for in the brain, then we can ask more precise questions. And also very, very clever experimental designs are, are super helpful that, that isolate the relevant thing that, that then you can look for in the brain um, if you want to. But um, the thing that I find very um, kind of it has a lot of initial appeal, but it's not as helpful as to say, we have an interesting behavior. Let's just see what's going on in the brain. There's going to be a lot going on in the brain. All I was going to say before is that even as someone who, I mean, obviously I run scanning studies and I look to see what's happening in the brain in some, in some of the work. Um, I'm critical of fMRI only because of sort of the way, how quickly we use it when we know so little. That being said, all of the things that we do, whether they're observable or unobservable, happen because of what happens in the brain, right? So um, in some ways, it's quite remarkable that over the last like 20 years now, there's consistency across findings from those who do neuroscience. Like it's quite, it's, there's a, many different methods that are used and from, you know, classic GLM type of stuff or multivariate now, it's, it's, it's amazing the consistency that you find certain areas and represent in areas representing value or certain things that are coming up again and again and again. And even in some of the earliest, you know, fMRI studies from like 
the early 2000s, um, those, those still have like, you know, play a big role in what we think about the things that we look in the brain, when we look in the brain today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think like the, the like the the take home message for me anyways is that there's a multitude of ways you can examine decision making a multitude of methods you can use to get at what you're really looking for. And you just have to make sure that you're kind of looking at it in the right way. Um, like Yael mentioned, like the brain does lots of things. And if you're just kind of going in blind, then you might kind of get lost in the process there as well. Um, and this kind of relates to um, one question I had and one that came up in the Q&A. So I wanted to talk a little bit about like what, what is computational modeling for anyone who's maybe not familiar with it as much. Um, and then I'll jump into the question that came up in the Q&A in a moment. Um, but we talked a lot about computational modeling as kind of this other really informative way to examine kind of what is happening when people make decisions other than kind of putting them in a scanner, examining what their brain is doing. Um, so maybe someone can just speak to what computational modeling is and how it's kind of used to help us understand a little bit more about what's happening when people uh, make choices or make a decision. Okay, I'll take that one. <laughs> um, I, a computational modeling is a way of essentially putting theories into equations, I think, is, is a way of, of putting it. So um, uh, lots of theories are expressed verbally. Um, and when we do computational modeling, we try to uh, quantify those theories um, to a large degree. So, so we put equations, we define variables, we put equations. Um, uh, we have parameters and um, because they're uh, mathematical, we can uh, simulate them and we can um, um, look quantitatively at what the predictions are um, uh, much more precisely than we might be able to do with uh, verbal theories. Um, so there's many, many types of modeling and I, I, I don't think I'll go into the details, but, um, um, uh, but, but yeah, I think that's the, the gist of computational modeling. Um, what most of us do here is, is something of the type of creating uh, little algorithms um, that, um, that say how we think uh, the brain might be manipulating information to make decisions. Um, and, then, and then seeing what predictions that makes for behavior and how that relates to uh, what we do observe. Right, perfect. That was a really good answer. I find it always a little, a little overwhelming to try to, to explain what it is, but I think it's it's nicely put that it's it's kind of a way, it's a hypothesized way that we think the brain is working, um, and then we try to see if that's true or not. And if it is, then it gives us really valuable information about well, what is specifically happening, um, how's it change across age groups or different participants in different contexts, etc. Um, so this leads me to a question from the Q&A um, from um, a member of the audience saying that I'm wondering for you, so the panelists um, and your programs, do, is the goal to be able to accurately predict observable decisions to understand the generative process driving choice or decision making or both or is it something completely different um, and whoever feels like tackling that one can feel free to go for it. I, I can start. Um... So I'm, I'm assuming that the question is about the goal of the computational modeling or the goal in general? Um, um, this question is about the goal in general, but it would be okay. interesting. I kind of saw the, the relationship there. So if you want to comment okay. on both. Yeah. Um, I think for me personally, the goal is not to predict behavior, um, but, uh, but to understand kind of what drives behavior. Of course, um, if I can understand that very well, then I can predict behavior. But let's say I had a black box, like a, a giant neural network that, um, uh, or a deep deep learning neural network, which is this these kinds of very fancy machines, uh, well, not machines, but models that can predict all kinds of stuff, but they're very, but you don't really know how they're making that prediction. They're very hard to interpret themselves. I myself would not be satisfied. So maybe that model would, um, that kind of network would predict human behavior on my task better than my best model so far. Um, still, my best model gives me insight into the process and into what, what exactly is being learned or how is it being learned or what is affecting the decision. And in that sense, kind of going back to your question of what, what are computational models, I tend to think of, I, I really like, well, this is not my idea, this, uh, my, one of my PhD advisors, Daphne Joel, uh, 
uh, she said, you know, she, she, she's not a computational modeler, but uh, she makes other models. Um, she said, uh, you can think of a model like a model in architecture. It's, you know, it's, it's, it could be like um, made of cardboard to look like, you know, what your building will eventually look like. Obviously it's not the building itself. You don't want it to be like, the goal is not to climb its stairs, right? The goal is to ask it some questions, maybe um, about aesthetics, maybe about uh, uh, the, the kind of um, uh, perspective uh, uh, when you're making it out of cardboard. Um, it, there clearly is a goal, that's why we build that, but the goal is not to have that be the building. And I think in that sense, um, my goal is not to completely predict behavior. My goal is to ask a specific question about behavior. Um, and there are all kinds of sources of noise that in any specific study, I might not be interested in. A different study, I might be interested in them. But in, in a specific study, it's usually asking a specific hypothesis and trying to understand a, a specific aspect of decision-making. And that's the one, that, that's the goal for me um, in any study and, and models are very useful for that. Did anyone else want to add to the answer? I thought I saw. I could, oh, sorry, was someone else? Um, I'm happy to add. <clears throat> I mean, I think all of us really are sort of basic scientists and that we're interested ultimately in, as you all said, the mechanisms, the, the, the processes and the, the computations and so on the brain uses to make decisions more so <clears throat> than the decisions themselves. But there are many applications of that, right? So I think you all already mentioned that she's particularly interested in thinking about the implications of these systems for psychiatry, what happens when they go wrong in a psychiatric patient or a neurological patient? Uh, how could that help us understand illness? You know, people who are interested in finance or interested in why do the ways we make decisions affect, you know, bubbles and stocks and why the prices of stocks and bonds behave the way they do. Um, you know, there are endless applications um, which are which are themselves important. And a lot of them involve predicting choices ultimately, um, as more of an end in itself. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to, to I think like they, both you guys just said, and it's more about understanding, well, what is, what is happening? What is trying to understand the process as opposed to predicting kind of the decision itself, the outcome itself, and kind of understanding, well, what led to that in either um, a healthy individual or individuals with different um, psychopathologies and kind of when, when things went wrong. I mean, understanding kind of what it is that led to the decision as opposed to just being able to predict the outcome itself. Um, I'm just checking to see if there's any questions that we could go off of that. Um, on the idea of computational modeling, actually, um, a question came up. Does the widespread use of specific computational modeling not risk reducing something very complex to something that's maybe too simple? Um, I want to see maybe what some of you think about that. What does too simple mean? Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I'm asking that as kind of a rhetorical question in the sense that it's, if, if it helps you, if the model, the model is basically a hypothesis about something. If it's a testable hypothesis um, that leads you to new understanding, then it's, you know, it's just complex enough for the thing that you wanted to ask. Um, it, it really is, I, I really think we, we can move from um, thinking about models as answers to models as questions. So sometimes you wanna ask a simple question, sometimes you wanna ask a complex question, um, but it, it really is a question in my mind rather than an answer. So, yeah, so I think this is a, I, I think this is a problem actually in my field specifically in social cognition. Um, and my take on this is that what a lot of people have been doing in the last couple of years or last decade, I suppose, is to borrow these quote unquote off the shelf models from cog cognitive science or cognitive neuroscience and to implement them in the social domain. Maybe not to say unthoughtfully because I think that's too harsh, but 
to think that, let's say, a classic or a, a reinforcement learning model might do a really good job of capturing X type of social behavior without really thinking through what are the guts of the model trying to get at. And so I think, you know, everybody here is sort of honing in on the same thing. The model can be built um, to do a whole host of things and ask a whole host of different questions. And it might answer one question really well, but be ill-suited for something else. Um, and I would argue that in the social domain, a lot of the models that are typically used, especially the, the ones early on, which I think are readily borrowed because of their simplicity, um, don't do a very good job of capturing the dynamics of the social world. And they can be a little bit misleading and in fact, not that useful for actually understanding the generative processes for why we do a certain, a certain thing in the social domain. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really happy you jumped on that question as well, because I think that was something I was wondering about and was going to ask you is that how, do, how does that translate to something in, in social psych that I feel like from my perspective, anyways, there's a lot more factors that these models may have a harder or the simpler models anyways, may have a harder time capturing. Um, so I guess to follow up on that, I'll ask you a specific question now. Um, what other factors do you consider when you're examining like decision making in kind of a, a social context? What other things are um, kind of things you need to pay attention to or integrate in a model that you would use or even just an experimental design for the types of questions you're answering? Okay, so now I'm actually gonna uh, echo Yael here and say that it completely depends on what you're trying to ask, because in some cases, something might be highly relevant in other cases, it's not. And so I think that the point is, is that you have to build models and paradigms that really reflect the heart of the question that you're getting to. And that, you know, simply borrowing a paradigm, and I think those things go hand in hand. So like a, a lot of times we talk about oh, the model, the model, the model, but the paradigm also has to match the model. The model has to match the paradigm. And those things are not always, I mean, I feel like that's a less talked about thing in, in at least, you know, computational neuroscience. Um, how do you make, how do you amp up, let's say the ecological validity of a paradigm to give you um, a more sophisticated model or something that you can play with that mirrors the tensions of whatever's happening in the real world, whether they be social or not. Um, but I mean, I don't want to bunt the question, but it's so broad because there's so many different things that you could you could think about. I mean, the most readily obvious one is the fact that like in the social world, I'm sitting here with all virtually sitting here with all of you and I have no idea what any of you are thinking or what you're about next to say or what question you're going to ask or so forth. And so that pro, pro, like poses a problem for me to if we're talking about chess. Like, you know what Nathaniel already talked about, how do you think, think forward through all the different steps? Like chess is a very bounded game. There is a game space. We can see it. We know how every player moves. That is not the case in the real world. We don't know how other people are going to decide what they're thinking, what they're going to do. Are they going to make a bad joke, a good joke? Are we going to laugh? Are they going to walk out of this meeting and say that it's over? The world is limitless. And so we have to, you know, act on that world and try to solve those uncertainties and figure it out. That's a really, really hard problem to do. We do it pretty effortlessly, but trying to figure out how people do it is a really hard problem, I think. I really agree with you, Ariel, that, um, you know, I, I started by saying there's no simple, that what does it mean simple enough, too simple a model, but it's really, um, you know, your examples from the social domain, I think, I think the problem is in their interpretation, right? It's again, it's going to that cardboard model of a building and saying, well, when I step on it, it gets crushed, so buildings must get crushed, right? That, that kind of thing, like making, taking a simple model and instead of asking it the questions that it can answer, making a sweeping um, conclusion that it's just not something that this model could tell us about actual humans, about societies, about social behavior, about dyadic interactions, about anything that we're, uh, that, about the thing that, that often um, the hype is about. So the, the kind of over-interpretation of uh, the scientific finding or the way it's then marketed, um, is, is really overreaching what you can say given the model. And that's where the, the model is too simple for the conclusions. It wasn't too simple maybe to ask the question it, it asked, it's just not for these conclusions that someone has taken the liberty to make. Yeah, I really like that answer. I think it's, it's, I think so we've been talking about for the last few minutes, at least is kind of like, well, it depends, you know, you have to make sure that your, your methods match your research question. I think that's, 
really, really important when you're talking about something very complex here, when especially in the social domain as well. Um, one thing that came into mind with the last few answers we're talking about is um, how humans deal with uncertainty. Um, we talk about uncertainty a lot in decision making. Um, so maybe each of you could just speak about like, well, what, what do we mean about when I say uncertainty? What am I really referring to? Um, and how does uncertainty um, make decisions harder? Like, do humans deal well with uncertainty? Are we very good at predicting what's going to happen when there's a lot of uncertainty? And how does that look like either in um, kind of our very rigid or um, our computer, kind of our boring computer games that we're talking about? And what do we examine just, uh, uncertainty in those domains? But how does it look like when we look at this in the social context as well? Um, so that was a kind of a long rambling just to say, well, can we talk a little bit about uncertainty and how humans deal with uncertainty in the decision making process? Um, whoever would like to start once again. Nathaniel, you should start. <laughs> um, I, well, I, I, uncertainty is a huge topic, right? Uh, and there, are, you, you can be uncertain even colloquially about so many different things. Um, and I do think that in decision making and learning, um, so much of it is about coming to grips with what we're uncertain about, uh, trying to predict the outcomes of different choices and how people respond to you or what uh, feedback you'll get or, or what reward or punishment. Um, and you might be uncertain about what the person will do or how they'll react or what, you know, how good the food will taste if you're ordering off a menu. And I think in many ways, most of what we all think about is how does the brain or how do people try to resolve that uncertainty to <clears throat> evaluate different courses of action to arrive at a, a choice or a decision. Um, and how that, and I think people are, in some ways good at that, in some ways bad at that. And, um, but it's at the center uh, of a lot of, a lot of these questions, I think. If, if everything were known, choosing the best thing would be easy, right? Just be like sorting the numbers and picking the highest one. Um, and I think it's not like that almost ever. Even when you're doing some, something that seems very, you know, ordering off a menu, it's a very well-structured decision. Like, do you want pancakes or do you want waffles? And yet that's still, you're, there's still, why can't you just put one's a 10 and one's a nine and choose the best one? Um, because somehow you're uncertain about something there and you have to figure out what's really better for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, why do you have to ask everybody else at the table what they're happy before you decide? <laughs> So many people do that, right? <laughs> Why? Why does it matter? <laughs> this is a good, I, I was going to say with respect to the last one, that's a good example. I think what, one of the most useful things about models is they show you when they fail. You have the simplest possible model. Here's the simplest possible model. I have a menu and I know what everything on it is worth to me with a number. So I sort it and I choose the best thing. And that's clearly not right for a bunch of reasons. And Oriel just mentioned a really interesting one. Um, so I think a lot of how we make progress is we come up with these stupid little models and then particularly in the social domain, they fail completely. Uh, and then we have to think about why. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's when, in my perspective anyways, it, it's interesting when the model works and you're able to predict it, but it's also interesting when it fails because you, you, you have this hypothesis like was mentioned and then you, you see that it's not at all like that. And I think that's just as informative. You can figure out why did it fail, of course, as having something be successful in these contexts. And you learn a lot from that, um, that mismatch between how you think someone is you know, processing something or making a decision, realizing that it's completely different from that. I wanted to add to the general discussion about uncertainty that, um, and this is again for, for um, you know, widening the discussion and also for people in the audience, is, is the, this idea that our brain is constantly, constantly facing uncertainty, even when we don't feel that it is on every single, so every word that you hear, there is some uncertainty about what it was, like what, not, there's uncertainty about the meaning of what I'm saying right now, but there's uncertainty about literally what am I saying? And um, the brain resolves a lot of uncertainty through context. You hear the rest of the sentence and it makes that one word make sense. If you hear a word in isolation, especially through Zoom and stuff, it will be very hard to figure out what that word is, but you have no problem listening to me right now because my sentences make sense 
because of context. So our brain is constantly resolving uncertainty through um, what it already knows, uh, you know, what, what are we most likely to be talking about, et cetera. So bringing prior uh, information into the setting and also using context. And one of my favorite examples about this com comes from a completely kind of, well, I don't know. It, it's like, I, I, it's a, from a sensory domain, but you know, um, so imagine you're going to um, hammer a nail into the wall. So usually, uh, so, so we hold the nail and then hammer, right? But you might like hammer over your own finger so that that's it, like, if you're not exact. So wouldn't it be great if someone else held the nail for you? But we often don't want, we don't want to do that. Even though that would make the other person's fingers uh, potentially hurt and not ours, we have way more uncertainty about where exactly the nail is. Even though we're seeing it, holding it will help us know where it is and will help us aim. If someone else holds it, we are way more likely to miss the aim because the brain will have less information to, to um, reduce that uncertainty. And so normally, you know, when we look at something, I don't think, well, I am uncertain about where that nail is, but in fact, I am. And the fact that I want to hold it and not let other, someone else hold it, hold it shows me that my brain is uncertain about where that nail is. And not to bring it back to the social, but I will because I care about this stuff. But hammering your own finger versus hammering someone else's finger also has major implications, right? So I would rather hammer my own finger than hammer Yael's finger because I would feel so bad. And so that also changes the dynamic of whatever, you know, observable choice or unobservable things that you're thinking about through all the machinations. Yeah, I was I was actually gonna <laughs> ask you about that one too. Is that there's there's definitely a social component there, and that kind of you know there's a whole bunch of morals coming through and other kind of processes that are make you also decide. Okay, well, not only am I more uncertain if it's someone else holding the nail, but there's also I really really will feel bad if I if I end up hurting someone else than just hurting myself by accident. Um, okay, I had a really cool question come up in the chat. Um, and it is about kind of a little bit about modeling once again, but maybe we can ask that one and then move on to another topic. Um, models are always numerical, right? We're kind of using math to help us assign numerical value to some kind of behavior or process. And the question is, is there anything in psychology or decision-making that cannot be quantified? Or can we quantify all the different processes we're talking about here? I'll, I'll say a little something about that, which is I, I feel like part of the goal of science is to measure things, right? Um, and there's lots of things that are really hard to measure and hard to know how to measure. Um, again, social interactions are a great example. Um, it's really easy to measure, you know, things involving money or, you know, manipulable quantities like brightness. And part of why we use theory is to push the frontier of the things we that are easy to measure and manipulate farther into things that are more abstract. But uh, again, in the social domain and other places, lots of things are really hard to quantify and even, you know, think about racism and morality. And, you know, we want to study those things, but if we want to study them scientifically, we have to try to figure out how to quantify them. Um, and that's a challenge, right? I guess I'd like to add um, that if you keep in mind um, the fact that all cognition and behavior, you know, um, occurs in the brain and in the body in the end, um, those are, you know, um, things that obey the laws of physics, right? Um, and, um, and in that sense, they're, you know, uh, uh, the mechanisms, right? And so, and so in that sense, if you, if you take this seriously, um, you have to hope that there's a way to uh, represent what information processing it's doing in a numerical way. I completely agree with Nathaniel that it, it can be extremely complex to figure out, you know, the, the right way to do that. But uh, I think for computational models, that's, um, that's a goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think I think I'd, I'd also agree. I think it's it's not always obvious or um, simple to quantify some of these more complex um, complex phenomena. But of course, if we want to be able to examine it, we do our best and try to quantify it. And maybe we fail and then we adjust. And it's this process of kind of hypothesis testing that we you know need to kind of find a way to quantify in order to talk about it across different uh, different fields or even across you know two different people talking about the same thing. So it's not kind of um, just a big mesh of you know, we are talking about the same thing, but we're not able to really communicate it properly. Um, so one interesting question again came up uh, in the chat is um, about different systems for decision making. Um, so the question itself is why do humans need multiple systems rather than only one to solve uh, to engage in decision making? Um, do we really, why do we need to allocate between different systems? Or maybe we should start with what are the different systems that we're talking about here? And how do humans um, arbitrate between the two? And why is it that that's kind of an ideal way to engage in decision making and not just have like one way of doing things? <laughs> You're asking. No, that's Go clearly. Ahead. No, the, I was going to say, Nathaniel, it's clearly up your alley while you're sitting just, here quietly. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose. Um, I was trying to see if I could lure one of you into answering it. Um, so I think it's a great question. I think what's, one of the things that's behind it is that people have an intuition. I think we all feel like it, that we're sort of of two minds about things or there's different ways of uh, making choices more automatic or more habitual or more deliberative or, or, or more reflexive. Um, and those that type of at least two systems, although it might be more kind of model is just everywhere. It's, it's very seductive. Um, it, Plato writes about these kinds of things. Plato writes about uh, uh, the soul as being like a team of horses, one of which responds to verbal commands and is well behaved and one of which is beastly and uh, are difficult to control, and the, the goal of the soul is to is to tame this team of horses. Um, it, it, and so, I, I think there's some truth to this, and it's something I've studied, and I think we've all studied. Um, it, it, why is it, it, it that, that's that it's such a ubiquitous idea, and yet so puzzling? If you think about it, it doesn't make any sense, really. Like exactly as the questioner asks, like if you're going to you know build a robot to make choices. Why would you possibly build it two different ways of making? How does that help? Um, it seems like it actually compounds the problem because either they agree, in which case you didn't need two of them, or they don't agree, in which case now you've got to figure out which of the two horses to sort of to follow. Um, and so I think the answer, you know, broadly speaking, is that different ways of making choices are useful in different situations, uh, and and we've evolved uh, a, a, a range of strategies, uh, or mechanisms that, that are appropriate. So if you're in a hurry and you're, or you're doing something that's very well practiced, um, we have very quick ways of, of, of guiding our behavior that don't distract us from other things that we can uh, take care of quickly. Um, but if there's a lot on the line and you don't have a lot of experience and you've got to really figure out what's the best, uh, move to make with a lot at stake, and not a lot of information, then you have other approaches that, that deliberate more. And then the question is, how do we, uh, if that's true, that also gives some insight of the arbitration question, like how does the, how can the brain decide when to deliberate and when to act? And it's presumably through weighing these kinds of costs and benefits, like am I in a situation where deliberation is likely to help me get it a better answer? Do I have time to do it? And so on. Um, so that would be a quick take. Yeah, yeah I think if I, if, sorry, Aurel, um, if I can add on to what Nathaniel said, which I agree with, um, it's like essentially different, like for any type of information you want to store, there's multiple ways to do it um, that will um, involve different trade-offs. So you, you can even take a computer, right? And you can, you know, store information in a way that's very accessible, uh, but costly, or a way that's less accessible, but uh, but less costly to store, right? And these days, computers have actually all kinds of levels of this, um, and, you know, have complex ways of, of trading off between them. Um, and I think and I think it's those trade-offs that matter, essentially different memory systems or different decision-making processes that 
um, uh, we used to uh, and, and rely on memory systems to to make those decisions um, operate on different ends of uh, our you know ends or like corners of those trade offs and um, and and so are, are more specialized for one type of decision than the other but I, I think the idea is that jointly you end up benefiting from um, you know the strength. Uh, overall through all situations that are not specifically linked to each one of those corners um, that they're a specific experts in. And so I think that's why in most situations we actually end up using jointly multiple uh, systems. So, you know, I, I find that like the, the dual systems, the two system argument, an interesting one. And is this being recorded for perpetuity that's gonna live on the internet? Just out most, <laughs> most likely, yes. <laughs> okay. um, so I'll say something that might be blasphemous, um, but and I hope I don't regret it, but we're here for an interesting discussion, so why not? Um, I personally think that the, the, the call for the two systems or all the data or the however many decades it's been now that supports the two systems is a need to satisfy human desires for simplicity. And, um, you know, we have all this data that says, okay, we have system one, we have system two, we, you know, you know, maybe it's more sophisticated, maybe it's not like a seesaw, maybe it's, you know, a sliding scale, but you can build paradigms that give you the data that you want. They can say like, oh, look at you have system, system one now, and it's, you know, it's fast and whatever. And you have system two, and now you're doing this. And, and the truth is, is that if you took that off, it might be a lot, I mean, it might, it might satisfy certain things. It makes things easier to study because it gives a framework. But I also think it's actually a little misleading because, you know, if you're only, if you're going to only use this framework and only like look in that particular box, you're going to miss the rest of the house. You know, you're only going to see this like tiny little window into what you think is going on, but you've created this framework that basically is shoehorning you into a perspective that is limiting everything else you can see. So, Oriel, are you saying there are more than two or less than two? Stop it. <laughs> How yeah, many? Like I was going to say there are definitely more than two. I was going to say there are definitely more than two, but, I'm, but I, as you were talking, I wasn't sure if that's what you were thinking, that this is oversimplifying or that this is um, shoehorning things into two extremes when actually everything is on a continuum or, or, or yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they, see, I don't personally think it's a continuum. So maybe there are many systems. I don't know if the right answer is there one system or are there many systems. I certainly don't think it's a seesaw and I don't really think that it's bounded by model-based or model-free or thinking fast or slow or one or two. I think it's a framework that we do to ease the problem of studying the mind. And we're basically handicapping ourselves. So, yeah, I would, I, I was, I, oh, sorry. I was gonna say that, you know, this idea of two, um, well, we, we already have like ideas of like at least four or something like that, but like if you can think about different axes of like, you know, one is do I have to make a decision quickly or not? Uh, or, or do I have time? Another is, you know, is this decision very complex or simple? Is this decision, um, uh, how much experience I have? But there's also, innate versus changing. So we have a lot, we have innate mechanisms or mechanisms that are, I, I don't want to say innate, but are very not flexible and change very slowly in our brain uh, versus mechanisms that are very flexible, but have other limitations because flexibility comes at a cost because you might, you know, learn junk in a flexible system uh, because you got some weird examples to learn from. So so that's why it, like it becomes more than two in my mind because there are the innate systems or like the fixed systems, there are the flexible systems, then there are the ones within each of these, you can have one that decides slowly and one that decides quickly. Um, so, so you already have four and, and, and it can continue on and on and kind of like, you know, as we get more sophisticated in our understanding, we find more ways to parse uh, what is going on. The brain has massive parallelism of doing lots of things. Um, in many ways, I think. I think one thing I would add, I mean, actually, I think I completely agree with Oriel on the substance and on some of even the kind of interpretation or sort of reaction. But 
for me, this is just another case where it's like we have a really simple model that helps us think about stuff, right? I, I think this is exactly what we we're talking about before. I, I don't, uh, you know, I would be the first to say I don't take these two systems as two absolute boxes at all seriously as the be all and end all. But I think it's been really help. I think it's been misleading and overinterpreted in many ways, uh, for sure. And I think that's the point that Ariel's making. But I also just like write about it. It's helped us understand that the brain is strategic about how it controls its computations, how it decides it has to, I mean, it really does seem like there, there are sort of speed accuracy trade-offs in how we, how we make choices and we can be more careful or less careful and we adapt to that into the situation. And to me, that's the message of this stuff. And that's the truth of this stuff, uh, which transcends whether there's two or three or five systems it's, it's, it's a more abstract point that is embodied in this very simple model that we can work with. Yeah, if I can add to that, I think it goes back to Yael, what Yael was saying earlier, which is that um, a model can be too simple um, for the conclusions people draw from them, you know, like for the interpretation people draw, draw from them. And so uh, I, I, I think I, I think the field still has some work to do on, you know, becoming a bit less arrogant about <laughs> the conclusion they draw. Like there's, there's this impression that computational modeling is, um, you know, a, a silver bullet um, that tells you everything. And, and it's really not the case. Um, and, and I think we've been a little bit overconfident in uh, how we interpret those results. But I think we need to keep them in, in context. I, uh, and I think, you know, what, what Oriel and Yael were saying, like, um, goes in that direction. I think the, one of the problems is though, is that the two model system is, it's so alluring, right? Like it's so, it, yes, I completely agree with everything that you're saying, Nathaniel. It helps us understand. And there's certainly things that do fall in those two sides or on some, some continuum of them. But the problem is, is that the oversimplification is oftentimes, and in, in fact, I think more often than not, taken to an extremity that does not bear reality at least the way I think about the world of how the brain works. So I, if the allure of the simplicity can sometimes be blinding in science and that's one of the problems. Luke Chang starts one of his talks, Luke Chang, who's a um, professor at Dartmouth uh, in psychology, um, starts one of his talks with how like everything is like there are two of it's like Noah's Ark almost like every system has like two the two parts anything that we study has two and he's like is that for real is the world all like divided into twos or is that just how we like to think about things or how it's easy for us to think about things as researchers and, and you know the underlying truth is is different um, and and when he puts all of these off you're like yeah that's got to be not real. I mean, that, that would be a huge coincidence if every single thing had like two, two poles to it. Also, I think uh, it's not a coincidence that Luke is also a social neuroscientist and Oriel's a social neuroscientist. And I think some of the places you, you, you I'm not making fun of you, Oriel. I, 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 one of the places where this thinking has been most over-interpreted to the most absurd degree, I think, is social neuroscience or social psychology. Um, and also, that's one of the cases where we really confront the most complicated and nuanced situations where, again, these types of very simple mechanisms and thinking break down in interesting ways. And, and, and so I think that's absolutely part of the issue here. If I can add something, um, I think even if we were to agree on, you know, four or five systems or whatever, um, and it was, I think we have pretty undeniable evidence at this point that um, no system is like independent in the brain. And so like none of the systems actually work on their own. They like, you know, like share information and um, and uh, depend on each other on in very strong ways. So, so in a sense, I think this comes from, uh, you know, the path of progress in psychology where we all started, you know, like studying phenomena at the first degree, right? Focusing on a single mechanism and we've made lots of progress on that. And so now we're making progress and, you know, looking at two together <laughs> and assuming they're independent and then looking at two and assuming they're not independent. And, you know, over time we, we, we're, we're complexifying to a degree, right? Uh, but um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. In that sense, I think, you know, like we have to be careful even when we talk about 
you know, uh, discrete systems that they're actually not, you know, like completely isolatable uh, things. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I completely agree with everything that's being said. And I think from my perspective, too, you know, you're having you, you boil it down to some degree to these two simple strategies or mechanisms that are at play. And you can start adding layers to it, like Anne just mentioned, is that you add complexity, trying to understand, well, when this happens, what, what, what is the outcome? Um, and this kind of relates to a question actually my supervisor is asking. So I feel like I should um, <laughs> share that with everyone. Um, so we're thinking about these models or these systems um, giving us access to certain basic computations a brain or a human does. Um, and now on top of that, or parallel to this, additional processes like developmental, aging, disease-related are also happening that can completely transform what is happening on this kind of more basic level. Um, and so his questions are, how can we model or access these processes and their interactions with a more basic level? Do we need different computational ideas to access these processes? Um, so the question here relating to kind of like some of what I do, but also kind of what um, some of you research too, is um, these disease-related processes. So different psychopathologies. Um, are these simple models? Are these kind of um, strategies we typically examine still very useful? Or do we have to modify them a lot to kind of examine these different um, additional processes that are added on to it. I can start with this one. Um, I wanted to say something though for the end of the previous conversation. I was thinking, um, uh, my dad once told me, my dad is a physicist, and he said that um, in math you have zero, one, and infinity. And in physics, you have zero, one, two, and infinity. And I was wondering if in neuroscience, it's like the place where we have, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, like they're like they're fundamentally different. You can't just go from two to many. Anyway, that was just a, a thought. Um, regarding aging and psychopathology and uh, and kind of changes in in in, in and development and changes in the brain, I think. I think in many cases, what we find is that, um, at least in the area of pathology, it's, um, well, okay, let me start by saying we don't know enough. So everything that I'm going to say now is like, you know, <laughs> or else that this is going to be online for perpetuity. And like in a few years, people will be like, she was so naive. Um, a lot of what we think about now is that pathology is an extreme version of kind of what's considered normative. So it's not necessarily the brain working completely differently. It's the brain operating at, in some extreme um, of a system or, you know, stuck somewhere in that, that kind of, in that sense. Um, do you have to use different models for that or not is, is almost kind of a technical question because sometimes, you know, that extreme might be that the brain doesn't make use of one you know, component that it can make use of or uh, simplifies um, some process. So you can say, you know, okay, I can use a simpler model for that. Um, but as far as current research that I know uh, that I'm familiar with it goes, um, it's usually the same kinds of models. Um, the same frameworks uh, and not kind of like for pathology or for change or for aging or for uh, development, we need to think about completely different setups. Um, we might be completely wrong. Nathaniel, you look like you're going to say that something opposite of what I said. So please go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure. I have. I, I just sort of feel like this is what we've got. <laughs> like, you know, if, you know, <laughs> these are hard questions as, as is clear and all the more so you know, to think that we could try to apply them to development or aging or schizophrenia. Um, and yet, what's the alternative? I mean, uh, so I, I feel like we, we've sort of carved out a, a little bit of understanding and we have a little bit of a foothold. And it is, you know, the best we can do is try to look at applications in the in terms of the best we understand about the, um, the sort of basic processes. Um, 
and and I don't I I think the the perhaps the encouraging thing might be that this is a two way street and again in the same way that the models that we use to capture rats lever pressing are terrible models of human social interactions uh, I think that by trying to bring these models into contact with psychopathology or, or aging, maybe we'll learn something about what we're missing that, uh, that will help us understand the basic science as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really like both your answers. I think I, I see it the same way as, you know, these models are what we have to try to understand what really the different processes we're examining. And depending on the population you're examining with these additional processes, it may just be an exaggeration of one in one direction or a decrease in another direction. And that these models, you know, they, they do help us get information at least to some degree. And like was mentioned earlier in the discussion is that sometimes that it will fail. And that's just as informative as to understand, well, this simple model that maybe did explain to some degree what um, one group was doing did not explain what another group was doing. And that's informative to understand just the fact that it failed and see, well, why is it that, that, that this model is no longer um, what this other group is doing? Um, I wanted to jump to another topic, if there was nothing to add on that. Um, something that was mentioned kind of from a few of you is kind of these different um, comparisons to uh, between the brain and a computer or a computerized system. Um, and we hear that a lot in decision making or in different kind of computational fields is that we're really approaching the brain as kind of this this um, this computer that does computations and would therefore somewhat be comparable to a computer. Um, and I want to get a few opinions on do you really do do we perceive the brain as a computer and why or why not? And how does that differ in terms of um, what we're examining as a research question? So just kind of a vague question here. But is the brain like a computer? Yes, no, or why or why not? So there's um... I don't know the reference for this, but there's a paper that basically, like in history of uh, science, that shows how um, people always thought the brain was uh, um, similar to the most, uh, the, the model for the brain was the most technologically developed thing that they had at the time. So the brain was a clock and the brain was a steam engine and the brain was lots of things. And now it's a computer because that's the most technologically um, uh, you know, develop things, things that we have. And the other day I was uh, uh, telling Nathaniel actually how I, like I thought Google, Google search is a pretty good analogy for memory. And I was thinking about this and I was like, okay, that's like the brain is a clock, right? Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, right now we, we, you know, we can say, well, the brain computes things. It's a computing device. Uh, so in that sense, it's like a computer, but it's probably not anything like the computers that we have on our desks because the way those computers you know that they separate uh their hard drive from their random access memory from their cpu and 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 the way those computers work is nothing like the way our brain works so um that analogy ends quickly i think i think also one thing the whole like analogy for a brain as a computer totally ignores the fact that human brains act on the world and computers don't, they just digest information. We're people, we're changing the space all the time. We're, you know, resolving uncertainty. This comes full circle on a lot of things that we talked about today. And that bears absolutely no resemblance to what a computer does. Any other comments or perspectives on the brain as a computer? I just wanted to say that we're all walking away to turn on the light because it's gotten dark. I saw Nathaniel doing that. I'm going to do that as well. Was it snowing behind you, Alexa? It, I, I thought I saw uh, snow before. Not now. It, it, it may have snowed. I know it was snowing earlier this afternoon. <laughs> so it's very possible, yeah. We're at that time of year where um, any day now it could be snowing. <laughs> I saw a lot of snow behind you before oh. as well, and I was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add that I, I, I totally agree um, you, you know our brain is like nothing like 
the real computers we have um you know to add to what Ariel said we also have a body right and our body you know um like has lots of impact on our brain um and you know like you could even go just like even if you isolated just the brain like it, it's acting in so much more continuous manner um than what um than what uh you know uh, silicon uh computers are doing it's it, i agree the, the, the analogy breaks down very 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 quickly i really I like we'll have something better than computers and then like yael says we can like make our brains like whatever the future is I really like your point, Oriel, that the, one of the fundamental differences is that our brains operate on the world. Our brains um, can choose examples. Our brains are creative, right? Where computers are not, not creative. They don't choose their input. Um, and especially that's, uh, I think, a really fundamental part of the kind of models that I work with a lot, the reinforcement learning models, the main, like one of the um, main ideas in reinforcement learning is you choose what to do, but you get reinforcement only for what you chose. So you can only learn about what you choose to sample. And that's that cycle or that, that, that constraint is a really important one. And for instance, thinking about computers in that sense is just like nonsense, right? Computers don't choose what programs to run and then learn from what happens to those programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not only that, but there's some like assumptions in now that we're talking about our RL where like, let's say, you know, something that looks and feels and talks like punishment might actually be rewarding. So I just saw a really interesting talk um, by Ian Ballard who showed that like, depending on how you construe what a punishment or reward is, like the punishment actually may be rewarding and yet we're construing it as a punishment because it's a loss, but like if it's going to help us learn better and figure out like on a longer time horizon, how to reap more rewards, even that immediate punishment that it's construed as a, a punishment is actually rewarding if in a like different framework. I actually have something to add to that, um, which, which actually also calls back to something else said before about how we're just completely surrounded by uncertainty and don't even know it. So actually reward and punishment is an example of that partly for the reason Ariel says Ariel said um one experience I had early on is we tried to do an experiment on reinforcement learning with pain and we hooked people up to this machine that would heat up their arms and burn them and then cool it once in a while that was supposed to feel better um and I swear to god you couldn't tell the difference and so we'd have people in the scanner and we were, we were trying to get them to like trade off reward and punishment and, you know, and, the, and, and you can't tell if your arm is being burned or it's being like cooling in a, in a, in a relieving way of around the microphone saying, doesn't that feel good? And, and you just, you have no idea that even something as basic as pain, like thermal burning pain is, is something that your brain has to figure out and interpret. It's really slow and really noisy. And you really have to use context to resolve that uncertainty about whether the stimulation happened to you is nice or not. Um, I, I found that very <laughs> striking. And just to clarify to the audience, Nathaniel, he didn't burn anybody. <laughs> so, uh, maybe burning is a term of art. We, we <laughs> used uh, noxious thermal stimulation, um, an uncomfortable temperature applied to the arm. Um, perhaps I'm actually really happy to hear this because I always get flagged for shocking people for money way back when in my PhD, one of the first studies that I did, I was like, how could you do that? So I'm so happy to hear anything. I was like, we're trying to burn you and feel pain and no one could feel the pain. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me think of um, on a less, uh, I guess, you know, more ethical side of things <laughs> is um, <laughs> There's a bunch of studies too showing that, you know, we in a lot of decision making and cognitive um, effort kind of fields and research, we assume that like effort is, is bad, that people don't want to engage in effort or don't, that that's aversive. Um, but it's not always the case, right? Like we, there's more and more research showing that, you know, we have people who really enjoy engaging, engaging in cognitive discussions, right? Who will be on a Zoom call from three to 5 p.m. to talk about decision-making and it's not aversive. Um, so there's just, I think, you know, kind of again, tackling or coming back to this idea of the brain as a computer, this to me is something that 
there's just so much complexity there. And you know, we, it, it, it's not always classified as it would be in a computer, how I would view a computer is like, it's not always one thing is bad, the other thing is good, is that the human system is much more complex than that. And something that would be bad and then good, like in Nathaniel's example, or something that we just assume is negative or aversive, like cognitive effort, it's not always the case. And then you have this weird situation where you're trying to motivate people to do something and you, you're offering money. And is, is that a proper motivator? Or you're trying and discourage them and you're like oh I'm gonna make it really hard and is that a proper um, you know uh, a cue that they'll actually find demotivating and want to avoid the task um, so there's a lot here that I think speaks to not only is the brain a computer but coming back to again like how do we even study decision making and kind of getting at we have to make sure our paradigm is is properly designed to get at what we're trying to get at with all these other nuances considered um, on, on that note I wanted to say that um, that's a really good example for how our intuition is not always correct. And really we need to test every one of our intuitions as, as you know, um, test it experimentally. And I just wanted to, to um, give an example for a study that it's exactly what you were talking about now about effort. So Andra Jana, um, who is a postdoc at uh, Michael Frank's lab um, at Brown University when she was a graduate student uh, here with John Cohen at, at Princeton, she worked on boredom. And um, uh, she gave people a task where they could choose between, they basically had, there are three scenarios. So your task is to guess uh, the next number. That's a task. Um, in one scenario, um, the next number is completely random from zero to 100. So that, you know, you basically can't guess. I mean, you can try, but um, you have one, one in a hundred chance to, to get it correct. Um, in another scenario, um, the numbers uh, come out of some, they have some kind of mean, some average uh, and some noise around that. So you can try to learn the, the average and be you know, closer over time to the correct guess. And they, importantly, I should say, they pay people by how, according to how well they guess. So the closer you are, the more money you are making in this experiment. And then in the third um, option, you're going to get a hint before every guess. That hint will be the correct number. So it'll tell you the number is going to be 57. Now, guess what the number is going to be? 57. Correct. Uh, trial after trial. People did not prefer to play this one. They preferred the one where they could learn something over time and get better and challenge themselves, even though they were literally losing money. Um, so that, you know, cognitive, cognitive effort in this case is maybe traded off against boredom which is to do something like, you know, just say the same number that you were just given. For Princeton students. For Princeton students. But then the other example that I wanted to give is we have a pet mouse in our house <laughs> and he runs on his wheel all night, every night, so far. <laughs> he doesn't have to go anywhere. His food is right there. And I keep thinking about the poor mice and rats in laboratory experiments that are raised uh, and reared and, and housed without wheels. And I think, gosh, they must really want to run really far and can't. Um, so, you know, that kind of effort is also, but like we like to exercise, so do, um, so do other animals. And that, that effort is rewarding uh, at the same time as it's effortful. Except at Princeton. <laughs> <laughs> um. Had something in mind and it's gone. Oh, yes. Um, something we kind of alluded to earlier on is I think Nathaniel was talking about having um, mice kind of in a, in, a, in a, or rats in a maze and kind of thinking about which route they would take. Um, and it made me think of kind of some work showing a re, you know, relationship or potential relationship between decision making strategies and navigation. Um, so maybe some of you can talk to that relationship. Is, is it something that we know? Is it something we think is there? Um, and what, what are the findings really showing about this relationship between decision-making and navigation? And why do we think there's a relationship? So for our audience who is like, that's two different, completely different things to me, like what, what is it that would be a possible mechanism supporting kind of both decision-making and navigation? Uh, I mean, I could take a shot at that I think 
one of the ways that you know one one thing that we have to make decisions about is routes or you know wh where to go um and which way to get there um and we have tried to think about those those types of decisions are are different from other decisions we started in the lab in some ways and similar in other ways um but one thing they do involve is this thing we were discussing about uh, some, you, you might be able to approach it by deliberation um, or planning of some sort where you think about which route you might want to take or how the best places you want to get to or how the best way to get there is versus some more reflexive strategy where you know that this is the um, uh, intersection where you turn right and you just turn right without thinking about the whole path. Um, so that that kind of thing is exactly the kind of it sound, it had, had it's the same kind of two system idea, uh, or at least it seems very similar as has come up in other domains for better or worse. Um, and so uh, that analogy in terms of these two mechanisms, supposed two mechanisms, uh, has been argued to, to involve kind of shared structure or mechanisms and trade-offs from um, as to other situations like setting which lever to press or which, which move to make it a video game. Um, I think one thing is interesting about this example, which again, maybe speaks to Oriel's point about all this is uh, sort of like chess. What you, what you really see, if you think about, you know, a rat running a maze and you look in his brain while he's thinking about paths to run a maze is what's really striking about it is that it's not, it, the right way to think about it is not like you think about everything and you do the right thing or you act. It's like he has to stand still in order, to, otherwise he doesn't think about routes. Brain represents where he's actually running. Um, so, so if he's standing still, then he can think about routes and that takes time, but there's lots of different routes so he can't think about all of them. And so really the, I think the right level, at least for this problem to think about is not whether or not to be system one or system two, whether or not to deliberate. It's really about of all the routes you could think about, which route does he think about or should he think about? And, and that's a much more sort of fine grained question. Um, and I think that's an example why this sort of two discrete system box that even for this relatively simple behavior, uh, as Oriel was saying, is just not the right way of thinking about the problem. Okay. I think another similarity that the, um, the navigation process has to many uh, real life decisions is, is it's um, a hierarchical structure. So lots of choices we make can be represented at different um, levels of granularity, right? If, you, if you're applying to navigate to, um, to, um, to your, uh, pick up your, your, your kids at school or something like that, um, you can, you know, uh, you can think of it as a sim single trajectory, or you can think of it as like, um, go to my car, then, you know, go to this midpoint, um, and then turn left and, and, and go to the other point. And, and all of those steps can be further subdivided into like, okay, you know, open the car or the door of the car, you know, sit in it, put on your seatbelt, etc. Right. Um, so that's part of the navigation, like it can be sub like represented at many different hierarchical levels. And I think that's um, a, a very big commonality to many other aspects of decision making in real life like you know if you're planning if you're deciding to have breakfast um you know you're deciding to have maybe like coffee and toast um which you know again you can describe many many levels of granularity so in that sense i think there's lots of shared processes um there hmm. so yeah and i think one other way where these questions of spatial navigation and decision making and you know relational information with each other like cognitive maps represent as a cognitive map gets really interesting in a social domain because if you think about let's say social networks if you're trying to figure out how to navigate through a social network let's say you want to tell somebody a piece of information um, or certain people a piece of information but you don't want it to get to somebody in your social network you have to figure out who those people are connected to, who they know, who their friends are. And so if someone were to say something, what's the likelihood of that piece of information 
a piece of gossip that you want to say um, of it making it back to the person you're talking about or something like that. And so they, these types of questions, you know, like a rat thinking about how to move through the maze also happens in our worlds, like our social worlds. And we think about talking to colleagues about, let's say somebody else, or, you know, about a project that's gone south because of what a different colleague has done and so forth. And they have a lot of implications for how we move about our social worlds in a strategic way and how we navigate that space. Hmm. It's super interesting. I think my 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 mind obviously goes to to how these change across the lifespan as well, and how like you know essentially in all these contexts, they're trying to create some type of of model or representation of your environment. Um, have you examined? I'm not sure if uh, maybe this question is not answerable either. But Oriel, have you examined how these kind of um, social processes of kind of understanding well who should I speak to? How does that change across the lifespan? Is there any research about how maybe that would change in older age, or is that Am I going too far here? <laughs> um, we haven't particularly in, in my lab done that. Um, the closest, and you know, some of this work that we're, we're looking at social networks and cognitive maps, which is led by um, one of my grad students, Jay, we're gearing up to study this in an incoming freshman class at Brown University. So they'll come in without a social network. They won't know anybody. They'll have no relationships. And over the course of a year, so this is like, a, I, you could argue is a developing brain if they're 17, 18 years old. We had to get IRB approval to study adolescents, essentially, um, because a lot of people come in as 17 year olds. Um, what's happening in their brain as they build these net, these complex networks, social networks of the people around them, how they navigate that space, what happens when um, a link gets broken, let's say, you know, a, a, no social network is ever static, right? It's just a snapshot in time, relationships are broken, and then others emerge depending on who you become friends with. So um, that's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head um, from what we're doing. But uh, other than that, we don't do too much in that space in the domain of adolescence. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting, and my my brain goes there because um, there's a lot of what I do is understanding well how do these things change as we age, right? So how do the models that we have that explain maybe very well or somewhat um, what the younger adults are doing, how does that change, um, and how are the younger adults constructing kind of like this this representation of their environment or a map of what they're dealing with, and how does that change as we age? So that was a, more of a curiosity question on my behalf there. Um, one question that came up in the Q and A. Um, is what is the advantage and limitations of studying decision making in the lab? What are your thoughts on studying or even manipulating decision making in the real world? And I guess anyone who feels free to, to tackle that one. I think a lot of people are now um, starting more and more to combine uh, studies of decision making in the lab and in the real world. And Oriel's example was a great one, you know, studying actual, you know, friendship making and social network making in the real world. Um, uh, there are lots of devices that we uh, wear or hold um, these days, like, you know, our phones that can measure all kinds of stuff about us, about our decision to move versus to sit down, our decision of where. Um, do they have GPSs? So uh, Kate Hartley at NYU has done studies of people's um, navigation motion through space and how that affects their well-being. And it turns out that the more places you go, the happier you are. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of work now on, on kind of both aspects in the lab and outside the lab. And of course, each one has its advantages and disadvantages in the lab. We can be very controlled. We, we make a specific experiment that tries to isolate one aspect maybe of decision-making. And uh, like, for instance, um, you described in the very beginning, or I think it was Anne who described that we, we teach subjects um, often in our kind of video games, um, we teach them something completely new so that we can take learning from its very beginning. Um, whereas in the real world, you know, you, we don't have that kind of control, but decision-making in the real world is obviously uh, I mean, in the end, we want to know how the brain works in the real world, not how the brain works in the lab. Uh, and uh, lab environments have all kinds of um, kind of idiosyncrasies and weirdnesses, right? So in a lot of our experiments in the lab, there is like a, a stimulus that you have to respond to or a couple of choices that you have to choose between. 
in the real world, you're choosing between lots of things. You're interleaving tasks. It's not very clear what is the stimulus. You see a you know, very complex situation around you. Um, so if we don't expand to thinking about that, our understanding of decision-making will be very limited. Yeah, I think that that's how I see it as well, is that um, you know, we, we study these things in the lab with our very you know, specifically designed paradigms and very everything is controlled, it's very specific. We spent maybe too long deciding which stimulus to use and why and how that answers our question more than another. Um, but of course, the goal is to not remain in the lab, is to understand, well, how does this work on a larger level than just in this very specific context? But examining it in that very specific context allows us to understand kind of really what we're trying to get at and then kind of move broader from there, of course. Um, okay, so we're in the last half hour of our discussion, and I think we've covered a lot of ground today. I think it was a really uh, good interaction we had, and I have a few more questions, um, maybe just to wrap it up about kind um, of like these, oh. Alexa, I just wanted to say a few yeah. people have been writing, uh, we've had some anonymous questions in the Q&A, and I answered them in writing, and I'm not sure the people who wrote the questions can see the answers. I don't know how, like there's a little note here that says that only hosts and panelists will be able to see the questions, but I don't know if that's true about the answers. So, um, just so Anna's read. over there waving at me saying that, yes, the, um, the person, the people who ask, ask the questions, sorry, should be able to see the answers. Um, okay. it's only, only the five of us that can see kind of the whole, the whole bigger. Okay, so I just wanted to direct to those who wrote the questions. If you see that your question just disappeared, go look at the answers tab, it will be there because it seems to just disappear when it's answered. Yeah, good point, thank you. <laughs> um, great, so I think, um, yeah, I had some other, like a few more kind of general questions, things to kind of start wrapping up um, today. I think we've covered a lot of ground. I think it was very interesting to hear everyone's different perspectives or similar perspectives on a lot of these um, decision-making questions. Um, one question I had, and I'm not sure if there is an answer to this, um, but it was a question I thought was very interesting, is um, what are some of the common misconceptions about your research? Or that you, you know, you talk to people about it and there's like a common misconception or kind of myth that you encounter a lot. Maybe there isn't any as well. I was just curious to see um, if, if you've encountered that and what would it be? I have one answer, which <laughs> again goes back to something that a number of people have said. Oh, Anne raised her hand. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump over you. Go ahead. Uh, but uh, I feel like when, and this really speaks to lots of this discussion, when I tell someone I'm a neuroscientist and we're trying to figure out how the brain does something, they imagine that the right way to do that is to like really take apart like all the little pieces of the clock and like figure out how they all fit together and really describe all the you know genes and proteins and spikes and synapses and and that that will be how you you know you figure out how this works and build better computers and um, I think uh, hopefully at this point in the discussion it's clear why we all think that's not the way to solve these problems. Um, but that that it, and I had this perspective too when I first got into science. I assumed that that was going to be sort of the approach, and it just turns out that's hopeless. Um, uh, and so I think one of the things that, that I've learned by by trying to work on these problems is the importance of abstraction. Uh, for understanding. I, I think on my side, it's um, uh, the most common mis misconception is, is where the field is at um, of uh, decision making. So, and, and I get both extremes. Um, so I think there's the extreme of people who you know, learn, I study learning or decision making and think I can help them, you know, be better decision makers and learners. And I think, um, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is, is still so far from being applicable, um, you know, is or, or usefully applicable. Um, uh, that I, I think that's a common misconception. It's like I, yeah, there's no way I can help you become a better of this or that. Um, it's like I'm still trying to figure this out. And I think the field collectively is, you know, except in very specific cases, not really uh, ready to do that. Uh, but I think it also goes in the opposite direction. Like lots of people, you know, still think we see the brain as 
with big mass and have no idea what it's doing. And um, and I think we know way more than many people um, um, think we do. Um, so that's what I encounter, I think. I think um, Nathaniel started by saying, you know, when you tell someone that you're a neuroscientist, so I told someone that, I, that I'm a psychologist, and that's even worse, because first of all, they think you're a clinical psychologist, and you're analyzing them at that moment, um, and uh, when there's, you know, psychology beyond clinical psychology, too, even clinical psychologists don't analyze you all the time, um, <laughs> uh, but then I think that it's, it's exactly what Anne was saying the flip side is this idea of like psychology, you know, is, is like just a whole mumbo jumbo about the brain. But like, you know, if you really want to, you know, if you really keep, are interested in the brain, go be a neurosurgeon. And I'm like, you know, why would you want to cut it up um, if you're really interested in, for instance, let's say fixing the brain? Like people say, you know, I really want to help fix the brain. Well, you know, you want to help fix the brain, be a teacher, right? Like teach people new things rather than cut up their brain. Um, I think there's a huge gap between what people think medicine knows and what people think psychology knows. And I think psychology knows more than what people think and medicine knows a lot less than what people think, especially about neuroactive medication, um, that, or psychoactive medication that, that affects our brain because that's limited by what we know about the brain. We might know that the meditation works. We just might have no idea how and why. I think it's it's really interesting to see that the that the misconceptions are at like the higher level of you know I, I I'm in psychology I'm in neuroscience I get that a lot too you know when you say I, I study psychology I'm trying to play with okay well if I say I, I study cognitive science like is 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 there is there a, a, a common misconception there as well and I think it's it's interesting to see that this is this is common in the field um, but that the, the there's um, movement forward to understanding really what it is to do psychology research. What is it to study decision making and not have to cut the brain open every time you want to see what it's doing? Um, and that's a just curious question I wanted to answer, ask, ask everyone. Um, the last question I had for um, you guys was, where do you think the field is going next? Or where do you think, where do you want it to go next? Or where do you see um, research kind of moving towards in the specific questions you're answering or just as like a broader field of all of decision making? I think the field is going to where Oriel is. To a lot more social and thinking beyond one brain thinking about brains interacting, um, both in terms of, you know, even the, like the, there's a very big um, explosion now of work in kind of computational psychiatry and psychotherapy and thinking about mental health, but that also ends up being a lot of social, like, you know, you can't ignore the social environment of a person when you're thinking about their mental health. So I think it will go more to there. But I should also say that I, you know, wouldn't have predicted where the field is right now 10 or 15 years ago. So probably what I'm saying is, you know, has no relationship to the future, to the far future. We'll have to stay tuned and see. Oriel, do you feel like the field is moving closer to what you do? What is your perspective no, on this? I don't. <laughs> I feel like there's a chasm between, you know, how I, who I was trained from in the, in the world that I was like, the academic world that I was raised and the topics that I studied. Um, but um, I have no idea where the, where the field is moving. I can't even begin to opine, but I hope that the future includes a role for emotion. And I think, yeah, also has probably a lot to say on this, but I think emotion is sort of like this, like bad step. I mean, it's always been like the bad stepchild, right. But it takes like different manifestations of the bad stepchild for like, if you were an econ, it was like, Oh, who talks about emotion? Let's talk about the rational brain. And now it's like, of course we know emotion, like you know, works on choices and we were there. Now that's what we understand, but we sort of still cast it aside and we have a hard time measuring it. And so, you know, what do we really put? We never put it into models or we don't never, but we rarely put it into models. Reward trumps everything. Um, I'm saying lots of, you know, blasphemous things again, but I, but I want to argue that there's like, I hope that the future includes much more of a focus on how emotion and affect serves as a as a signal to guide learning and social learning in particular 
Interesting, interesting. I'm curious to see, uh, Anne and Nathaniel, what you two think. What is your perspective on this? Where is the field going? Or maybe you have no idea. <laughs> I think I actually also thought it was going toward Oriel. So I want to hear more about why she thinks it's not. Um, but I think more generally, I just think we're sort of pushing out from, you know, simple basic things that we figured out from people playing video games and, you know, isolation to more complex and relevant scenarios. One of which is social interactions with everyone, I think lots of people are really excited about and for, for good reason. And another is psychiatry, which a, a number of us are excited about, uh, as you also mentioned. Um, uh, yeah, and I think that, I, I think it, it, it really is this sort of process of sort of building up from, from very basic things and trying to, trying to get, get to the next steps. So, so I might have a lower field of vision <laughs> because that's I wouldn't have answered the same way. Um, um, but but maybe that's me, you know, being more focused on what I'm doing. Uh, I actually think there's still so much to do at the basic level, like in the lab, in control experiments. Um, we're still so bad, you know, really at understanding decision making and learning in in simple contexts that I think um, the field you know, is going to stay there for a while. Um, it, it seems to me like the field is moving um, more towards computational modeling and recognizing more, you know, the, the utility of computational modeling, which I think is a positive. Um, I think the field, as any other field, has a tendency of getting stuck in, you know, uh, in um, what's the word, uh, you know, like frameworks that uh, uh, that that we explore very deeply for a while, and you know, then like it, it start seeing more of the limitations of. So that, that's not something I wish, but that's I think something that's happening for sure. Again, I think uh, actually I think navigation and reply and stuff like that is the newest hottest thing um, that's going to be there for the next ten years probably. Um, uh, but but. That, that, you know, that's my prediction rather than my wish. <laughs> Interesting. All right. I think that's it. I mean, that's all I wanted to ask today. I think we covered a lot of ground once again, and it's really interesting to see um, a lot of similar perspectives on the topic, but also some slight discrepancies in having uh, this discussion with you. So um, I guess just to finish up, I wanted to like, thank all four of you for taking um, this considerable amount of time to talk with me. Um, and it was really interesting to you know, talk about all this with um, other researchers that are interested in decision making like myself. Um, so thank you all, and thank you to our audience who kindly sat through all of this as well. And I'll turn it back to Anna. Well, thank you, Alexa, for inviting us. Yes, agreed. Thank Thanks you. So Indeed, thank you. Well, you're all taking the words out of my mouth, <laughs> Alexa. I just we just wanted to congratulate you here on behalf of all of us behind the scenes for or so expertly organizing this panel um, and moderating. You're you're a real pro. So <laughs> thanks so much for all the tremendous amount of work and energy you've put into this, and all of you for your time and insights. And we're really excited to see it heat up here and there. The engaged conversation is what it's all about over here at Fourth Space. So thanks so much again for your sharing your ideas with all of us. Uh, I know that we had a bunch of people watching on YouTube and excited about this conversation. So I'm sure uh, other folks will relive it <laughs> a number of times um, in part anyway. Uh, on that note, I think I'll just um, thank the folks who also came in the space on either side of the screen. We appreciate you coming into what was snow, rain, sunshine, all mix of things today. And uh, those of you on Zoom, we appreciate you being here. Thanks for popping those questions into the Q&A and chat as well. Okay, on that note, we'll say have a great weekend. Thank you. You've given us a lot to think about. We appreciate you. Until next time. Bye, everybody. Cheers. Bye.